afternoon, everyone. We're very happy to welcome you for this uh, Thursday of our policy forum on open government in the education sector. We had a very rich day yesterday during which uh, we discussed about the use of new technologies to facilitate citizen engagement. And we also had a very rich session talking about how to make the link between open government and more accountability in the education sector. So let's now turn to the third day of this uh, policy forum that is going to be a very interactive day. I hope since uh, you will have uh, the opportunity to, to exchange uh, as uh, we will discuss later on. Before giving the floor to the moderator of uh, our day, uh, Sam Roberts, I wanted to encourage you again to share your experience uh, through the chat and also to raise questions to our uh, panelists also, not waiting for the end of the presentation, but all along uh, the way as uh, they speak. Without uh, further ado, let me give the floor to uh, Sam Roberts. For your information, Sam is the head of open government and open data at the UK Cabinet Office and has worked as a policy official under four different administrations. Sam represents the UK on open data and transparency policy at a number of multilateral fora, including the OECD and the Open Government Partnership. And he's also currently the chair of the Data 360 Working Group at the Digital Nations. He has been working with different uh, multidisciplinary teams over time, including data scientists, Uh, Sam, to have you on board, and so I'm very happy to, to give you the floor. Thank you, Muriel, and thank you so much for reaching out to uh, select me as your moderator for this event, it's an honour. Uh, so this session that we're going to be embarking on today, we're going to be speaking for a little over an hour, and it's a, a workshop session, panel session, sorry, about involving citizens in the planning cycle. What are the limits and what are the risks? So we have a number of fantastic speakers that I'll be introducing shortly to kind of talk about this topic. And then we'll be moving on to a short break followed by some breakout workshop sessions and then we'll bring it all together at the end of the day. So um, as you've already said, if there are any questions or if there are any uh, thoughts or ideas that anyone would like to raise, please do uh, reach out and we can, we can refer to you as we go. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first presenter. So our first presenter is a professor at the National Institute of Educational Planning and Administration in India. Her academic interests include education of the urban marginalized, school leadership, fostering, particip uh, fostering partnerships with stakeholders and the right to education and its implementation. She has published several research papers on educational issues of disadvantaged groups, privatization in Indian education and positioning school leadership in the Indian context. She's contributed to conceptualizing, planning and implementing national and international level training programs and workshops, playing a significant role in carrying out the national school leadership development program across the country and taking a lead in the implementation of NISHTA program for school heads and teachers. So to present a thematic study on school management committees in India, please welcome Dr. Sunita Chun. Thank you very much for the kind words. And um, I would really like to thank the moderator as well as the IAP, especially Dr. Muriel, for giving me an opportunity to share the findings of my study in this forum. In fact, she has you know, uh, created a professional learning community through this forum because we have been able to contact with many more researchers across the different countries. And maybe they are, talk they are also working on the same thing. So it, I am very delighted to be here. So the, my study, you know, they tried to probe three major questions. One is why open government education in India? Why the need was felt to have a open government education in India? And second part is what do we mean by really open education as far as the Indian uh, Indian context is concerned? And how it is being operationalized through the school management committees which have been created with a focus on 
which is the major theme of this research project, transparency, citizen engagement, and the accountability. In fact, you know, I would say that, you know, I would briefly I'm not able to go to the other slide, you know. So let's me do it for you, Sunita, and just okay. make, make sure okay. you are really speaking okay. Okay. On, on your mic for interpreters. Okay. Yeah. okay. So then, you know, as far as why there was a need, first I would answer the, address the question, why there was a need. Indian education system, if you see at the left side, you can see that Indian education system is very huge, you know, having a, 1.5 million elementary level schools and 0.5 million secondary level schools. And at the, at the elementary level, it is basically the government which is you know, running the schools and the students are participating in this way in the government sector only. And especially the children from the socioeconomically educationally backward you know, places. And elementary schools follows various structures, grade, you know, one to five, six to eight, and one to eight. And the SMC structures have been made, you know, mandatory in these schools, which is, you know, elementary. And the student's population, as far as Indian society is concerned, is diverse with different social, economic, religious, and linguistic backgrounds. So I am proud to say that diversity is a pan-India phenomenon. So it is a very large and diverse government education system. And it was felt that the top-down approach will not work if we really want to improve the quality in education. And therefore, we need to adopt the bottom-up approach for the planning and implementation strategies to make really to meet the expectation of all the population. So the need was felt for people participation at micro level, so that you know the learning outcomes can be improved, and for capturing the efficiency of the education system at the macro level. And there, if you see you know, the, as far as the you know school management committees, they have not emerged suddenly. There has a history behind it, and you know that is the historical presence of community participation in the schooling processes. Is, you know, India has a long tradition of a community participation in the schooling processes by donating land or paying the salaries of the teachers and ensuring attendance of. Students. In the ancient time, you would see that they were the community owned schools. Gradually, when the state took the responsibility of making education, you know, they took the responsibility of making it accessible to the different uh, people, then the community in school processes, you know, there was a, some kind of a loose linkage. There was a weak linkage between the school and community, and the school, the community play remained at the peripheral level. With, you know, by uh, maybe post 1990s, I would say, the education witnessed a paradigm shift as president go in the school governance of India is concerned. From It became from centralized participatory, ensuring transparency, accountability, and inclusion of all stakeholders at the school level. So this is, you know, school-based management was initiated and we had, you know, many, many educational constitutional reforms that had taken place in the 1990s. So the participation, in fact, you know, strengthened at the school level with the enactment of the right to education. And the school management committees, it became a platform of school-based management for citizens to seek, exchange, or review new ideas and information of government policies, schemes, and operations. So they have been constituted as per the guidelines given in the Right to Education Act, and they function to bring in transparency, citizen engagement, and accountability in school processes. Especially, you know, we really feel that, you know, though the system has expanded to a large extent, but still the quality remains a major concern as far as India is concerned. Define what do what is you know my second question you know which the study addressed was what is open education as far as India open education in Indian context can be described move towards decentralization away from the centralized structure to local institutional at the school level autonomy and planning so now we want to give more of autonomy to the schools to make plans for themselves and to plan for it and to also evolve the strategies so that the learning needs of all the things. For a better perspective on a bit open education in India, the study used this conceptual framework. 
these were basically there were these were the three tenets you know which were basically used what was of course you know the which makes a for which forms you know fundamental you know as far as the study is concerned it is the right to education right to education 2009 act and right to education we i do not you know say that only it is right to education accessibility to, to education or the schooling facilities available to education but it is also rights in education that the learner as i said in the beginning the learners are from diverse backgrounds to meet the learning needs of all the students the rights in education has to be ensured but the most important is right to education so that we develop the capacities for exercising other human rights we develop the capacities of the citizens of the students of the children so that they can have a other human rights like you know right to expression right to movement a right to you know even have a dignified life so another one which is very important is the convention on child rights 1989 we are there you know because the children are you know this convention talks about that the children have the right to express and that they have the right also to be heard but since you know we are talking about the student population who is from 6 to 14 years of age group so then school and community have to become as guardians and protectors of the child rights especially the community becomes as an agency for their wise for the wise of the children and related to this right to education capability approach which was propounded by the amritya sen so it also talks about developing capacities of the citizen to empower them to realize full potential of their life so this was a basic conceptual framework which was used for the study and you know when we are talking about you know citizen engagement transparency and you know other then we have to see what was mandated in the right to education because the whole basis for looking at the study was as to what was mandated what was stipulated as far as the right to education was concerned and that we are talking about the you know what is the structure next module please uh, just uh, sunita just to ask you if you can just keep your um, mouse in front of the screen because if you move your head it's a bit difficult for the interpreters to listen to you oh so sorry so, so sorry <laughs> just to, to make okay, the, okay, the okay. life easier thank you yeah i think maybe teachers talk like this the way i'm talking i will now i have to be you know little bit <laughs> disciplined you know i have to be disciplined okay so as far as the, the constitution of the you know uh, this attempt is concerned the structural composition it stipulates that the 75% of it should be the parents are the guardian of study children studying in that particular school they should not be from outside the school and out of the 25% remaining 25% one third should be from the local authority one third could be school teachers and one third could be academicians and half of the members has to be the women and members has to be elected through the election process the election process is like this all the children are given you know communication to uh, through them the parents get the communication that the elections will be held for and if they want to send their nomination to the for for the for being elected to the school management committee and when the nominations are received after that the meeting of all the parents is called and the elections takes place and through the either by raising hands or through the ballot paper and then depending upon the enrollment of the you know school if it is a huge school then maybe the ballot papers and then the whosoever gets the majority they are elected to that so again please you know we are going to muriel can i have next one please then we have another is what are the functions of smc which were you know very limited in the beginning but after the amendment they were increased it is basically monitor the working of a school whether the school is working in the stipulated 210 days in a year whether the school is opening on time whether the teachers are coming regularly so this is the monitor the working of the school the most important is prepare and recommend school development plan which is one of the very very prime function of the smcs because it will form the basis for grants to be made to the school by the appropriate government although there are you know there are there are guidelines for the you know schools to be getting the grant from the government but there are you know if something special has to be made like if the boundary wall has to be made or if some other kind of a class has to be made so it will depend has how kind of what kind of a school development plan there the most another important is monitor the utilization of the grants received from the appropriate government 
and hold rag because they are the representative of all the parents. So hold regular meeting with parents and guardians and appraise them about regularity in attendance, ability to learn and progress state in learning. So they have to ensure the children, if the children are not, you know, in the school, in their neighborhood, they have to ensure the enrollment and attendance of all children, especially disadvantaged. And facilitate non-enrolled children access to a participation in special training. In India, we give from one month to six months of a training. If the children are out of school, then we make them prepare for that particular class, and then they are, you know, admitted to that particular school. And the most important thing is prohibit private tuition by teachers in the school, which is a very common phenomenon in the Indian system. Another one is monitor teachers not overburdened with non-academic duties because, you know, they are put on the election duty on the collection of the census data. So they have to see that they are not overburdened with the non-academic duties. So these are the functions of the SMCs. But, you know, the studies have, you know, not really reflected on the private tuitions. The studies have not reflected on the, uh, reflected on the monitoring of the, uh, you know, uh, non-academic duties. So we do not find any such studies. I must say two things, you know, the studies of 50, around 50 studies were reviewed and we had a, you know, thematic, you know, thematic review of literature. So in the transparency, there were sub themes and in the accountability, there were sub themes in the citizen engagement and the studies were classified according to that. And there one, one could find, you know, there was an overlapping of the studies, you know, they were found in the, you know, in the citizen engagement as well as in accountability, because nobody, no study, you know, really, you know, really focused only one aspect. They focused on the general structure as well as the composition, as well as the, you know, functions of the SMC. And one of the most thing, important thing is that, you know, since the studies were collected from across the country, from across the different provinces of India. So then some studies were having a similar kind of findings and other studies were having a contrast finding. Muriel, can I have the next one? Then, you know, this social audit, you know, monitoring of school activities. So I have just, you know, made a gist of it. The transparencies, what was, you know, how transparent was our system to tell the SMC members on their roles and responsibilities. How transparent was our system on the effective and clear communication on school funds and its utilization? How did they procure school funds? How do they utilize it? And how, what are the sharing of school policies and programs? With? So how transparent of our system was? That was one aspect we consulted. Another was involvement of um, participation of SMC members in the school activities, in the routine activities, especially women and disadvantaged sections and whether the regular meetings of SMCs were taking place. If they're taking place, then only the citizens can they engage. If they are not taking place, then how would they get engaged? So that was one of the important aspects which was taken into account and involving SMC in decision making of the, for the functioning of the school. That was the third thing that, you know, under the citizen engagement. As far as accountability is concerned, I would say that it is basically principle of accountability is the trust building and sharing. If you have a trust and if you feel confident that the other party is also going to share uh, your responsibilities, that only you know, the accountability work. And whether the SMC members were having a role clarity, whether there were SMC's building, capacity building was built on their roles and responsibility, whether they were, you know, told about, you know, how, what kind of a function is expected of them and what, how much was they involved in the school development plan and the school audit mechanism. So these were the three, you know, basic aspects. So since you know the time is limited and we have we, we cannot really deal with all the sub themes. So I am going to give you know gist of all the sub themes that which is basically what was the findings as far as the transparency is concerned. It is very encouraging to note that you know SMCs were con con constituted in most of the schools of India as it was mandated in 2009. And there is a variation in total number of SMC members. It depends upon the enrollment of the students. Some schools were having 100 enrollment and some were having 1,000 or 2,000. So there was a variation in the SMC numbers. And the most of the SMC were not aware about the procedure adopted during SMC elections. In some of the places, the 
procedures were very well you know defined and they were elected by following the procedure which i which i you know said in the beginning but since at some places it was the school had you know which were appointing the members on the educational background of the parents or on the economic status of the parents and so they're not following the strict procedure of the you know voting you know in most cases you know the very important you know finding is that in most of the cases the sfc was actively involved in the disbursement of the incentives like the winter meal distribution of textbooks and uniform they were very effectively functioning at at some, at some places smc members contributed to increase in enrollment monitoring of school school development planning and even monitoring of teaching learning process here i would just add you know some of the states are educationally provinces are educationally advanced and here we found that the smc members were you know more actively engaged in the teaching learning processes and the academy and that the smc meetings held less frequently than mandate that it should be a once in a month but at most of the in some of the places it was you know after two months or after three months and although the register would say that the meetings were held every month And there was variation in the level of awareness towards role and responsibilities of SMC members because the system was not that transparent that they could tell them about that. And despite the most disturbing, you know, finding was in most of the cases, despite joint bank account of the school with SMC presidents, that is head teachers, they were not forthcoming of financial powers, sharing of financial power with SMC members. But they, they felt. that smc members are not possessing necessary competency for monitoring fund flow and utilization and you know i don't know whom to you really we should say where do we find the fault because if their capacity is not being should we say that smc members are responsible or the you know school management is responsible and the most important thing is that you know in our, in, the, in our indian system the social caste you know is one of the social groups you know is one of the very very important aspect and we could see the class and caste you know divisions within the smc members and our class and caste identities needed to overcome to you know ensure the actual participation and there was a low awareness and competency on the preparation of school development plan in most of the cases so at the indian education system i would say still do not have a mature transparency mechanism in the smc function this is you know out of the review i could you know come to this kind of a conclusion as for citizen engagement i would not like to repeat and most of the things have already been said as far as the transparency is concerned there was no clear indication of decision making processes in smc members were engaged in many cases limited participation of women and disadvantaged groups and sometimes what happens you know this is the reality sometimes what happens we i have been to many schools that in one of the schools of course in in the northern india the women with the veils were participating you know where the activity at other places we have seen that sometimes they send their husbands although the women are supposed to be members that they send their husband to the smc but you know smc are functional but not included in the development process of the school so citizen engagement also varies across the states across the schools and across the different places so we cannot say but of course that much i would say that at least the meetings were taking place and they were attending they may not be that frequent they may not be as per the mandate but the meetings were did used to take place and they are that the the members are at least the quorum has to be completed and they come for the meeting this is another and the last one is about the accountability in the functioning of accountability in the what else can i have the next so few studies pointed to the involvement of the smc members in the preparation of school development and which is one of the signature significant role of school management and few studies revealed members were inadequately prepared to collaborate on preparation of sds pf with the school and what happens in few instances school development plan was given to smc members and prepared by the teachers and the head teachers and their domination of teachers in the smc meetings were also found many studies revealed 
expect low education level of parents and the community to be a major limiting factor. And in few places, capacity of SMC built on annual evaluation of the school activities did take place. So one could say that lack of capacity building program and effective you know, participation of SMC in school processes is still, you know, a one of the concern areas. So one of the very, very encouraging, you know, and one of the very, very, I find it to be a very good, you know, that the development that has taken place is that training modules at least has been developed by all states on the capacity building of the school heads. So it could be used as a self-learning material. It could be used for the capacity building of the school management committees, but about only 20% of them were trained. And the training was not context specific. Each area in India, you know, has a diverse, you know, in terms of geography, there are hilly areas, there are plain areas, there are, you know, flood prone areas. So the training was not context specific and it adopted one size fits all approach. And that became one of the, you know, major stumbling block for the capacity building. So I could say, you know, in the conclusion, accountability is a two way process. It is not a unidirection. School are heads are accountable to SMC members for sharing the agenda, details of funds received, utilization of funds, save their collaboration in school development. And parents become accountable and develop ownership in the school. Basically, if you know they, they are dependent on these factors, they can become, they have a ownership only if they have the role clarity. If the trust is reposed by school functionaries and involvement in school decision making. So then, you know, though SMC members responsible for conducting effective social agenda due to non-clarity about their role and low capacity building program, they are not able to perform assigned role in all the schools. I would not say, you know, it is, you know, in some of the schools, they were really, you know, accountable and their capacity was built. And in fact, you know, when um, uh, SAP talks, you know, who are you are dealing with the open data, the study also talks about the open data, data which is available to the Indian, you know, communities, to all the Indian teachers, educators, everybody it is available. And this open data, you know, can be used by the SMC members for planning of the school development plan. Muriel, can I have the next please? So what is the impact of the school management committee as far as the efficiency of education system is concerned or the quality in education is concerned? A short short impact would be that at least I would like to see that all the SMC members are elected. The meetings are held very regularly. There is a more involvement of SMC members in decision making processes so that you know the educational needs of all the children can be met. And the more awareness of roles and responsibility could be executed vis-a-vis -vis school input. The medium term, you know, I cannot visualize in all the situations that, you know, the medium term impact can be seen. But in, in some places, we have seen that they are the academic supervisors. But in the medium term, I would see they, their role is emphasized as academic supervisors along with the school. They do not only deal with the infrastructural issues, they do not only deal with the day-to-day -day routine activities of the midday meal and the textbook, they also become academic supervisors and the involvement in the learning process of the children becomes very, very important. And they also become, you know, some kind of a, I would say, security gods. They become a god to see that, you know, there is an improved service delivery of the principal, teachers and system level functionaries, at the district block and the cluster level. So they have to really monitor that they are functioning the and they are performing the assigned role. So I think you know that would be really great, you know, if their capacity is built to become a capacity supervisor. Can you have next please? Long term impact. So SMC, you know, the long term I would like to see that SMC represents disadvantaged section. It improves access not only in physical terms but also the social distance between the school and community and between the different social groups. 
So SMC is active, active participation, I think, you know, in the long run would improve the quality in education. And they would be in the social audit by the group of societies protect the educational interests of the children. So SMC will bridge the gap and equity aspect will be because there are different kinds of a social groups, the equity aspect will be. So effective SMC functioning will bring not only equitable and inclusive outcome, but also significant socioeconomic changes that can alter the power relations within the society. It is not only that only one group is, you know, having a voice and one group is dominant. My last, you know, is, uh, slide, you know, it is a key recommendation. SMC members need to be given more, you know, autonomy to fix the you know, accountability of the school towards the education of their children. SMC members also need to be facilitated to contribute in, I would really stress that in open budgeting, because it will look at the, you know, the corruption part, it will look at the malpractices and regulating finances and monitoring academic activities to make open education a reality. And SMC members especially and teachers are trained regarding rights of all children. We have, you know, a PASCO Act which protects the, you know, sexually abused children. So then, you know, they should be made aware not only about their own role, but they should be made aware about the chapter itself. We need to capacitate the you know, SMC towards redressal mechanism. Yesterday and day before yesterday, Kiran was talking about the NCPCR. So we need not go to the national or the state level commissions. The redressal mechanism, if the rights are violated, it should be available at the school level only the SMP happy you know, responsible for that. And capacity development program of um, SMC towards election process, role and responsibility is very important. And SMC members must focus on children with special needs. That is my you know last recommendation that they should if they want, we want our society as per the SDG four equitable and quality education for all the children, then they should really look into the different kind of students from different socioeconomic students, and especially the children with special needs. Thank you. Thank you very much for patient listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chu. An incredible presentation uh, that covered everything from the size of the, uh, the school system in India all the way through to the legacy, all the way through to the kind of uh, barriers and issues I guess you're facing in implementing SMCs. And there were some really interesting points in there, particularly for me around things like open data, we talked about social equity, some really interesting points. And we've had some great questions coming in on the live stream. I just wanted to say we'll, we'll refer you to those after the next presentation. So we're gonna move on and, and, and uh, move to the next presenter, but then we will come back to you, Dr. Chu. So thank you so much for that presentation, wonderful. Um, so without further ado, if I could uh, introduce our second uh, presenter. So uh, this presenter has worked for 25 years as a coordinator and director of projects on local governance and social accountability in Madagascar. He is a founding member of the NGO Saha and the president of the National Association of Massey Evaluators. He is an agricultural engineer with 24 years of professional experience, 20 of which have been collaborating with rural communities and Malagasy civil society. And he has expertise in participatory planning and budgeting, project evaluation, and the capitalization of experiences and institutional development. So to present a case study on open policy and local consultation structures in Madagascar, please welcome Aralanto Ravello Manansoa. Aralanto, the floor is yours. Bonjour. Est-ce que vous m'entendez bien? Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'd like to thank the facilitator for giving me the floor. And uh, thank you, the organizers, for having organized this forum that gives me an opportunity to share a, a case study that was conducted at a midterm of an initiative in Madagascar that was uh, uh, steered by uh, the Saha NGO. So it was financed by the World Bank and a specific part of uh, the World Bank that's called the GPSA, the Global Partnership for Social uh, Accountability. Uh, this is a four-year project 
it began uh, a few years ago. It has now been completed in 2017. So the initiative was focused on support to planning and uh, uh, participatory uh, budgeting in uh, towns in Madagascar. The towns in Madagascar are parts of the decentralization effort underway in uh, Madagascar. There are over 600 of them in the territory, but only 46 uh, townships were considered by this project. So it's a relatively small project, a small scale. It, we can refer to it as a laboratory project. And it selected a local consultation structure, LCS, that was installed by decree in Madagascar in 2015. And this is a structure that's not yet mandatory for all of the townships, only for those townships that are convinced that it is relevant and necessary. Hence, the choice of project So that was back in 2015. And we wanted to use this structure as an experiment to, to, to look at part, uh, citizen participation and involvement. So we were looking at service quality in one sector. One was education, the other one was health and land management. You can see to the right the strategy for co-engagement that we used. It started with an evaluation of the services in education, uh, health, and land management by citizens. And when we say by the citizens, it's a matter of speaking because the citizens were directly involved in the evaluation with the technical services. We call them contractors, but also with the local authorities. So this is the evaluation process then this there were recommendations and priorities that came out of the evaluation these were passed on to the local uh, consultation structure which as i said before was established by decree so let me just talk about their function so this this is a multi-party multi-actor consultation structure and the technical services are represented within the lcs and of course the citizens and that was was the focal part of the project in other words that civil society and citizens had to be represented and not just the technical departments and authorities within the lcs and once again this was formally established uh, via uh, a municipal decree then the results of the consultation were passed on to the decision makers, to the uh, communal councils, and they tried to integrate them in the budget for uh, municipal planning. And then there will be uh, implementation of the budget and those achievements have to be monitored by decisions that are part of the LCS or who may not be direct members of the LCL, but who are organized in what we call uh, consultation colleges. Let's move to the next slide. So this is how uh, it's organized, the local consultation structure. Uh, look at what we have on the left. So we have what we call these colleges either at the uh, the local level or Fokuntani, which really means a neighborhood. So why do we call them colleges? That is because the size of our townships is quite broad geographically. We have 10 to 20,000 inhabitants per township, and we have between 10 to 20 neighborhoods or districts. So to represent all of the population, these 10 to 20,000 people, it's very difficult. The state 
has decided to establish these colleges uh, to represent the people and each college uh, appoints three or five representatives who will sit in the LCS. So the goal, of course, is participatory democracy, uh, empowering of the citizens, contributing to uh, the decision-making processes. Thank you. Once we've understood the uh, existence of these LCSs, especially in the area of education, the information that is passed on by the uh, township authorities and by the other uh, actors, such as the technical departments within uh, the LCS. And here we have uh, plans to improve education, the communal budget, which includes uh, the priorities for the education sector. And there's uh, other information such, such as transfer of resources uh, from the state, activities or projects in the educational field that are uh, decreed by the state or other partners. Anything that may be discussed that is of interest to the actors will be discussed within the LCS and if the LCS is well composed, that is, that it is uh, truly representative of uh, uh, all of the stakeholders, you know, the key organizations, then the decision. It's important to know that this information is quite exhaustive, comprehensive. Be discussing everything at the same time. Have to devote to education is quite limited as compared to uh, the tremendous issues involved. Let's move to the next slide. The case study was initiated to try to remedy some practical uh, aspects or failings of the projects. We had basically gathered some perceptions uh, of the population and specifically relating to education. And what's important is to talk about how people were able to access information. Yesterday, we heard a presentation that was made by uh, Muriel Poisson, who was talking specifically about accessing information, but specifically for the parents. They gave priority to uh, mail and posters as being the means that are the most relevant or most appropriate for them to get information. And usually it's reporting by the district at the neighborhood level, the local radio station, you know, just uh, conversations with neighbors and uh, communications with uh, the decentralized education uh, outposts that are very important. So the project enhanced communication, knowing that this had been the feedback and these were the priorities. So basically we were diversifying the uh, channels of communication. And that was uh, the decision that, that was uh, taken as a priority because there's such a diversity of actors involved based on their level. First of all, the district, the neighborhood, the townships, and also the veering uh, officials and uh, people involved. Once this information was passed on, we looked at how this information basically is passed on at level at the municipal authority level. So this is what we found. 
How did the feedback loop back? Most people were uh, in favor of uh, interacting directly with municipal authorities. It's very understandable because the townships that were sampled for this study are all in rural areas. And there was no a telephone by even by phone, even phones are not widely used. I'm not even talking about internet or any electronic means of communication. So it was really direct uh, conversation or channels of communication. And we thought it's important to note that information uh, circulates better when the consultation is done at the grassroots, that is at the level of the colleges. If it's open, it works well. So there's discussions prior to the meetings of uh, the uh, LCS and especially on educational issues. This is where we found that what was missing in our information system was that the project initially was sort of active at the township level, but not at the district level. And this is why we found that we really needed to go further down to the grassroots and to work at this college or district level. Now, uh, the perceptions on how the feedback was used, most of the people of the respondents said they did not know whether the information had been used or not. And in our townships and in Madagascar in general, we're just barely starting with these kinds of mechanisms. We have about 90% who consider the information is taken into account systematically or very often. And so based on those 19%, we actually consider that's not bad. So what did we do to do capacity building at the level of the township uh, to both receive and process the feedback? And we specifically looked at the mechanisms to handle grievances. We heard the grievances that they were there in the evaluations, but we did not see people were actually filing grievances, that is uh, paper grievances. So there, a lot was done to uh, strengthen the mechanisms to manage the grievances. There was a slight surprise that came out of the study. We noted that there was a certain percentage of respondents who said that there was collaboration between the stakeholders. Uh, you saw in the circles, you see in the circles where there was a, a strong collaboration. But what we have seen there's a perception of, in the case of conflict, at different level of consultation and consultation. So the recommendation that uh, that came out of this was to improve the link between the schools and the uh, commune, the township, by mobilizing the school committees. We, we heard a lot about uh, these uh, school uh, committees. 
And these uh, SMCs initially uh, were uh, underutilized. They were neglected. And it was as we were going along that we decided to uh, strengthen the uh, connection between the SMCs and uh, the LCSs, uh, the consultation structures. So what was the uh, change in trust? As I said, there was a better in collaboration between the stakeholders. And I think that There is, a, as a corollary, better trust. What the project showed, and I've already said this, was that it was necessary to strengthen the governance of uh, these school committees. What did we do? We uh, worked with the technical services, that is their work, but the project used uh, or went through the uh, technical departments to disseminate the information about these LCSs. We observed that most cases, the uh, directors of the schools and a few uh, influential officials would uh, advocate. So what are the risks or the negative effects that we can anticipate or that we can uh, manage in terms of the LCSs. First of all, the general trend, and that's why we're here, is to minimize the importance of consultation and dialogue in decision-making processes in the education sector. And just uh, as a side story, the uh, SMCs in Madagascar are made up of representatives of the communities and uh, education officials from each school. So why is the community represented? Because it, it performs a very important function in Madagascar in education and in the development of education. So if there is a breakdown at that level, then you might have a school that's built in the wrong place, or you may have a, a school built in an area that's not a priority area. And of course, in terms of resources, you have uh, townships that can help uh, the schools uh, with funding. So that's why a consultation is so important. And it's very important to uh, focus on this link. The ministry has started uh, to think about how to give to the commune, the township, part of the subsidies for the operating of schools. But this is something that's just being thought about. So our recommendation is to apply the good governance principles of transparency in the operation of the LCS and LCS colleges. And of course, this includes uh, the uh, SMCs. To summarize, because there are many factors either on the constraint side or on the success side, but I wanted to uh, talk about some of these constraints. There's some divergent understanding of citizen participation amongst all of the actors involved. I'll give you just one example. Uh, education staff sees or views as this as an interference in their own operations, any kind of citizen involvement. And their argument is that these are people that they are specialized and that they really know what's involved in improving quality of education. 
and the citizens will just criticize the quality. Then uh, there's less than optimal cooperation between the municipality and the sectoral services. The system the gestion the management system is still centralized and as the success factors so you have the leadership of the township uh, in information management the ownership of principles of uh, good governance and local support and strengthening of local relays this is my last slide and uh, we have some recommendations uh, I'm sorry, but I can listen to the Spanish translation, which is a bit disturbing for me. Right, uh, recommendations for the initiative. Now, just to sum things up. So, intensify communication on transparency and accountability. We still at this stage, we really need to raise awareness and also ensure that these principles uh, are enshrined and we have to improve the resource mobilization at the community level. We have to ensure sector development. We also have to strengthen ties and connections between uh, uh, local consultation structures and the school management committees. We also need to strengthen feedback to the national strategic uh, level because there's so many things that don't depend only on the local level. So the uh, national strategic level should be kept abreast of all problems uh, and uh, developments. And in order to uh, make it sure that this initiative is long lasting, we must consolidate the diverse experience of uh, civil society organizations in order to guarantee better information access. Now, in order to end this presentation, uh, let me speak about what was the uh, what followed on the person who was spearheading the project obtained a funding cycle and the, the person was actually taking charge of three sectors and instead of now uh, the person just focused on the health sector and i think uh, we did have a lot of uh, advantages and uh, there were a lot of plus points and I think the, the efforts must be uh, focused on a single sector, it, the health sector uh, and the education sector is also being uh, developed within the framework of this initiative. Thank you so much for your attention. And uh, I'm available to take any questions or comments that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Arilanta. Merci beaucoup. Uh, there are a lot of questions that have been coming in on the on the live stream, so we have uh, quite a bit to get through. But I'd like to next introduce, if I may, uh, very quickly our, our discussant for this session. So, um, the director of Open Government, Open Gov Hub, the consultant for the World Bank, the OECD, the participatory budgeting project, and the Democracy Fund, and a founding program coordinator for civil society partnerships at the Project on Middle East Democracy. And someone who's worked with over 100 nonprofits in different capacities, uh, Nada Zodi, the, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Good day, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to be joining you. Um, uh, so, as Sam has mentioned, I'm the director of the Open Gov Hub in Washington, D.C., um, and we support a network of over 50 civil society organizations, uh, international NGOs who are really uh, committed to bringing more open government reforms around the world. 
Um, so I hope uh, today I can very briefly share with you some of the insights from the NGO community and international civil society groups um, on some of the trends which we see around open government reforms uh, in relation to the great presentations that we've heard today. Um, I know there's many questions, so I'll try to be very brief here. Um, but I really appreciate um, Sunita and Hari Latu's presentations uh, because they uh, are such a great reflection on some of the, the common challenges and opportunities uh, in implementing open government reforms. Um, so just very briefly, I want to identify four common risks that we see in implementing more citizen participation in public policymaking. Um, and what can we do uh, to try to, to reduce those risks? Um, so uh, each of which have already come up in these, in these presentations. Uh, so one common risk which we need to think about, of course, is the lack of representativeness. So are the citizens or the parents uh, you know, participating in these committees uh, really representative of the entire community um, that is being served? Um, of course, this is always a challenge, no matter how large the community is which you are um, working with. Um, but one of the ways that we can address this is really to think about that structural composition um, of the committees um, or of the advisory councils. Uh, so this came up in both presentations. In uh, the example of SMCs in India, we can think about quotas and limits to who is involved in the committees uh, to try to have them be more balanced. Um, and uh, to really think about the different power dynamics that will always exist uh, in, in these, in these uh, opportunities. Um, it's also important to think about things like term limits uh, to make sure that we rotate uh, who is actually being involved and who gets a seat at the table to advise how, uh, you know, how a school um, is being run and how the education policy is being implemented. Um, so it's, it's good to have really a mix of, of levels of participation so that some people can, can have a deeper engagement and to remember that not everyone has the time and ability to participate in, in some of these councils, um, but they can still raise their voice in other ways, in surveys and other forms of consultation. Um, so, so that's with regards to the first risk around uh, representativeness. Um, a second risk, which is very common, is that uh, you know, policy can be complicated and require specialized knowledge, which can make it hard for some citizens to participate in, in those processes. Um, but uh, as Hari Latu just mentioned in his presentation, you know, we know this is the reason that that some uh, you know uh, education um, uh, you know public servants and and uh, representatives might not want to have citizen participation in their in their councils. You know, they see themselves as the experts, um, and of course, they have important technical expertise. Um, but, you know, people are also the best experts in their own lives and in the, the needs and challenges that are faced by their communities. Uh, so one good way to think about this is to recognize the different forms of expertise, which are very critical to solve the shared social challenges and educational challenges, which we're all working on. Um, and another way to address this risk, of course, is through capacity building uh, uh, efforts, uh, which Sunita also mentioned. Um, step one is to make sure that trainings exist, uh, especially to help people understand uh, budgetary information, fiscal information. Um, this can often be uh, rather complicated for, for um, people who are not specialized in these topics. Um, so make sure that the training exists. And step two, you know, make sure to follow through that, um, that the, the capacity building efforts uh, are actually being uh, implemented as consistently as possible. The third uh, risk, which we see in some open government projects, is when people over rely on technology to be the solution, <laughs> uh, when in fact technology should really only ever be used as a tool for engagement and as a tool to, to facilitate feedback and different civic voices into the policy process. Um, but just because we built a website and published some open data, for example, uh, you know, this is an important step but it is not the solution itself. Uh, we, we need to always start with a clear problem and try to get citizen feedback from stage one to define what is the key problems in this school or in this education system. Um, and then make sure that we have a process to iterate and to continue collecting feedback, listening to the feedback and making changes uh, based on this. 
And then the fourth and final risk uh, I just want to mention very briefly, it's probably the most important one. Um, this is the risk that you seek feedback from citizens, uh, which you cannot act upon. And then they become very disillusioned with the process and decide not to participate again in the future. Um, this is just a very uh, important risk that we consider uh, because if you ask someone for their involvement and for their efforts and their opinions, and, and they make a lot of effort to contribute, um, but they don't see any changes or they never hear back from you, you know, they, they will be much less likely to participate again in the future. So even though there will always be limitations to how much change we can make, it is so, so critical to close the feedback loop. Um, Hari Latu was also mentioning this in, in his presentation, you know, even if you cannot make all the changes, which some parents or civic uh, committees are recommending, uh, at least report back to them on what happened, right? Why you can make the changes or why you cannot make the changes, um, because this is how we close the feedback loop. And really, this is an issue of trust. Uh, it's maintaining the trust and the, the confidence between uh, citizens and government to enable future collaborations. Um, so of course, there's, there's many risks we need to think about, um, but there's also many rewards to doing open government policy reforms and having these civic advisory committees. Um, so I, I just wanna end with a, a very quick example um, coming from the Philippines. Uh, some of you may have heard about it, um, an organization called GWatch. Um, many years ago, there was a research report which discovered billions of pesos uh, of, of the education funds in the Philippines were going to waste because the companies hired to deliver the textbooks across the country uh, were just not doing their job. Uh, you know, it was a, a good example of, of corruption. Um, so there was an amazing collaboration between government, citizens, uh, Boy Scout troops, people at the national and local levels all coming together to monitor the delivery of textbooks across all of the islands of the Philippines. Um, and it really helped uh, helped avoid, you know, billions of pesos worth of, of funds going to waste and making sure that the textbooks that were promised uh, were actually being delivered to the local communities. Um, so I hope we can end on a bit of a, you know, hopeful note about the, the promise of collaboration, uh, even as we try to mitigate the risks um, that come with it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Nada. Wonderful points. Well, well made. Fantastic. And um, so we are running close to the time, but I am going to go ahead and ask a question of each of our uh, main main uh, presenters, if that's if that's OK. Um, first, I would like to pose a question to Dr. Chu, uh, if that's possible. So, Sunita, if, if you could possibly answer, how can we ensure the full and effective involvement of SMC members in decision making in schools based on your experience? And the thinking around this is because school head teachers and principals will often tend not to involve SMC members in some key decision making in schools in, for instance, crisis or conflict affected countries. Uh, I would uh, again reinstate and reaffirm, you know, the point which I had made earlier also, that the, if the SMC members are given more autonomy, you know, if they are given more autonomy, because then, then the school will be also accountable to them then I think, you know, they will be involved more in the decision making processes, because the basic problem is that, you know, they do not have that kind of autonomy that, you know, if the funds are not utilized the way they should be utilized. So they can, if they raise the wise, but if no action is being taken on that, you know, that becomes a problem. So one is to giving them the autonomy. Another is giving them, you know, the capacity building program has to be made, you know, available to them which really fulfills their needs and which also tells them as to what are their roles and responsibilities, what kind of a role is expected of in the, from them in the decision-making processes. If they are made aware, then only they will be accountable to that. And then, you know, you would need to have a more of a, as you know, uh, Nada says that, you know, we need to have a more representation from the different social groups and economic groups. It should not be based on a one or the two groups. So then I think that the season making process will be, you know, really possible and it will be more flexible and it will be possible for the wider representation of the different groups. And I think it would be more effective in the decision making process. The autonomy, I would again and again re-emphasize if it is given to them, like if the teacher is not coming regularly to the school, you know, if teacher is not teaching in the school, if they become the academic supervisors, 
And if they report it back to the education department, and if the education department takes some action, you know, whatever the, you know, they have pointed out whatever they have said, I think their, you know, their decision making process will be more engaging and there will be more accountability in the system. I think this is my observation. Thank you, Dr. Chu. Fantastic. Absolutely. Autonomy uh, is the, the key word there, I think. Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, if I could move to Aralanto and just ask a very quick question before we go to break. Um, one of the questions that's come in is around um, what is the experience, sorry, is the experience of local consultation structures or SLCs um, in the education sector similar to that observed in other public sectors, as far as you know? The LCS is actually looking into many other sectors. It's the lifeline of the community. It's for the development of the community. As I said, the LCS does not have a lot of time to only focus on one sector. And this is precisely why we have this college structure that uh, uh, has a broader mandate and look into other sectors as well. You also have to be very mindful at the municipality level because there are so many projects uh, are, that are taking uh, for instance, sanitation and water. Now, these uh, projects would require consultation structures and funding as well. And it's and even a funding for implementing the structure itself. So, since there's so many resources to construct infrastructure and everything, people are motivated to participate. But then we forget the other sectors. And uh, we really have to bear in mind the community development. That should be the core. That should be really imp important. Thank you, Arlanzo. Fantastic points, absolutely. Okay, I, I think uh, we're getting to a point now where we're going to need to go and take a 15 minute break uh, ahead of our workshop sessions. So um, if I could bring this session to a close, a massive thank you again to our two fantastic speakers and to Nada for her fantastic comments as well. And uh, I think we'll uh, return in 15 minutes to, uh, to discuss this in greater, in greater detail. Thank you so much.
Maria, you can start. So colleagues, uh, let's uh, get back uh, to the final session uh, of this uh, policy forum. Uh, which will be a very interesting session, in fact, uh, because that's a session during which you will have the opportunity also to draw lessons from uh, all the discussion that we have had over those three days, and also to share uh, and to discuss your own experience regarding open government initiatives with uh, other uh, participants. So I'm going to give you some uh, basic uh, details about how we are going to organize ourselves uh, for this uh, last uh, interactive uh, session. The idea of uh, this uh, session is that you exchange among your linguistic groups. So you will be groups into uh, linguistic uh, groups. And you will have, in fact, one hour to exchange among yourselves about the main lessons and the main practical recommendations that you would like to draw to what all we have been discussing over those uh, three days. So to formulate key recommendations, especially aimed at decision makers, educational planners and educational managers, based on what you've heard, but also based on experiences that you know that are underway in your own country context. To guide you a little bit more, the idea is more or less to follow the same structure in your discussion that we have had as part of the agenda of this forum. First, to try to formulate recommendation on the first point that we discussed, as you will remember, during our first day, how to ensure equal access and equal use of open government initiatives. Second, that you reflect on well, what specific recommendations could be um, formulated regarding the second topic that we discussed uh, during also uh, the first day of this forum, which is related to the use of new technologies, online platforms and other forms of ICTs to facilitate citizen engagement that you formulate also a recommendation on the very important topic that we discussed, especially yesterday during the day two of this forum about how to make the link between open government and accountability. And finally, that you also formulate a recommendations regarding the last topic that we discussed this afternoon on how to address the main limits and risk associated with citizen involvement in the uh, planning and policy cycle. So, of course, in one hour, you won't have time, you know, to have a very long list of recommendations. So the idea is that you don't come uh, with uh, uh, 20 or 25 different recommendations, but that you come out only with one recommendation for each of those topics. So just one recommendation per question, which means altogether four recommendations. And if possible, when you formulate recommendation, one recommendation in each of these domains, that you refer at least to one successful approach that has been piloted in your respective country context and that you consider is of good support to the recommendations that you have been uh, formulating. So uh, to help you uh, in this process, we have uh, designed a table uh, that may help you uh, to do so, where, as you see on the, on, on the screen, well, we have here the first uh, cell uh, referring to the first question, how to ensure equal access and use of open government initiatives with the idea that you formulate a recommendation here and you provide one country example supporting this recommendation. On the second question, exactly the same on how to use new technologies to facilitate citizen engagement, you formulate one recommendation as part of your group and you provide one country example supporting your recommendation. And the same with the third one on how to make the link between open government and accountability and fourth on how to address the main limits and risk associated with citizen involvement in the policy cycle. Again, recommendation and supporting uh, examples. So we are going to leave it here for the colleagues that are part of uh, the YouTube streaming, just to tell them that the, once again, you will have one hour to discuss this as part of the chat 
that you have uh, uh, that you are, uh, have the possibility to to access, and that we will come back in plenary to share some of the main outcomes of your uh, discussion at uh, three thirty uh, Paris time.
So welcome back to all of you. I think that we are now ready for the next session that would be the group reports. I hope that you have had a very intense exchange with the colleagues from the same language of your group. And so I'm going to hand it over to Sam. So we're just waiting a few minutes for everyone to come back to the plenary session. And in fact, the moderator, Sam, is one of the group. So it seems that they're having very active exchange as part of the group. So we are just waiting for them to come back as part of the plenary session. So just one or two minutes, colleagues. Ah, I see that everyone is back. Good, super. <laughs> On n'avait pas le choix. <laughs> so Sam, as you are both a group participants, but also the moderator for this session, I'm uh, hand it, uh, handing it over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Muriel. And uh, fantastic sessions, uh, really, really interesting conversations that we had on the English speaking group. Um, I will call on the uh, various session leads, if I may, to, to give uh, an update on the, uh, on, on the conversations that were taking place in the various groups. So, um, Oksana, as it was our group, may I, may I call on you first to give a, a, an update and a summary of the things we discussed? Thank you, Sam. I also enjoyed these uh, conversations. And uh, I will jump right away into the first question, how to ensure equal access and use of open government initiatives. So with the different examples, we came up with the four, four steps. Uh, we would start with the le legislative measures, obviously, that provide for possibility to engage on the legal level. But then in the practice, we need to have the open data and transparency and agreement uh, for joint action so that citizens uh, can engage, can understand uh, how they are engaging. And for all of this, for working, communication is a crucial um, environment to take place in. And especially with the example from Finland, we've heard that um, in the society, there needs to be the discourse for uh, understanding that education is relevant. So relevance of uh, education is uh, the very important point for citizens to see the uh, engagement as meaningful in this um, sector. For the second point about the use of technologies, uh, we have two recommendations. So first one is using technologies for the discussion of curricula and improvement of learning materials. Uh, we had uh, good examples for uh, this working in Finland and in Philippines. In Finland, there was an uh, online platform where everyone was able to engage into the discussion about school curricula. And it seemed to be a successful case. And also in Philippines, uh, with the challenge of pandemic, more and more blended learning uh, has been introduced in schools. And um, there is a technology, a platform that allows uh, for everyone, for uh, citizens, for parents in the first line to give the feedback about the mistakes that might be there in the printed materials. So it allows to improve the quality of the uh, materials, of the learning materials through this uh, feedback and communication channel. And the third, second advice that, uh, or second recommendation that we have when designing these technologies, we need to think of users uh, and to design the technologies in a proper way that they are welcoming people to use them, because this is a huge challenge if we have technology in place, but no one uses it. Uh, it can be good, but <laughs> it will be meaningless. So thinking of users when designing technologies, our second recommendation. Uh, the third question, how to make the link between open government and accountability. Here we have one recommendation um, that is based on the example in Philippines, and it is ensure 
that there is the link and the engagement of civil society. So engagement of civil society and third sector is crucial uh, to provide uh, accountability. And our colleague from Philippines, she said that uh, these channels, these possibilities to cooperate with civil society, they should be institutionalized. So it's not only speaking about it, but indeed providing the channels for the engagement, for dialogue, and institutionalizing them through decision making, through uh, legal channels, and uh, through practices. And to the fourth question, how to address the main limits and risks associated with citizen involvement in the policy cycle? You will see two questions in one, because we had to identify first the risks and limits, and then uh, to create recommendations how to address them. <clears throat> so the first risk, uh, that is a huge one. Uh, if people don't see any responsiveness in the engagement, it has uh, the risk that they will be demotivated to engage again. So the recommendation is to ensure responsiveness, transparency, and be in contact with the CSOs to make sure that citizens understand the decisions so for that, we need to keep the discussion, even if the decisions are maybe not reflecting or 100% um, responding to what citizens proposed, people need to understand why there was a different decision in place. So the dialogue is important. Uh, the second recommendation is uh, with regards to uh, com communication and use of technologies, because we see a huge um, risk that people are uh, lost on the way uh, if we use new technologies, especially those who do not understand or have no access to technologies. So the recommendation is in ensure proper channels of communication to meet the citizens' capabilities to engage. Uh, so we need to consider online and offline combination when um, using technologies. And the third point um, that came from Finland again, that it's important to ensure education for democracy among children already. And uh, in Finland, there is an example that every school has to have the decision-making body for pupils. And also from Romania came an, an example that they have similar pupils councils, but not in every school, but in those that they do have, those um, councils they showed or they proved to be a good practice for um, this democracy education among children. That's it. If maybe Sam wants to complement something, <laughs> because he was in our group, please. Thank you. Thank you, Oksana. Uh, yeah, it was a fantastic discussion. I think you've covered absolutely everything, but I think there was a real uh, common, uh, I guess, set of challenges that we all kind of face. I think there were some really interesting conversations. And I think, you know, there were some discussions this morning around the, I guess, the the tran transitory nature of some of these issues. They're, they're, not, they're not only uh, present in one area. So issues dealing with uh, accountability and transparency in education, also transfer into other sections as well. And I think it's really important to kind of think about that holistic uh, kind of, I guess, story and picture around all of this. So, so thank you so much, uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, if I can uh, call now on the uh, Francophone group, um, I believe uh, Jonathan Dupont is the, uh, is the spokesperson for that group. If you'd like to give us a, a, an overview, uh, Jonathan. Oui, uh, merci. Alors, on était un petit groupe. Yes, thank you. We're a small group in the French speaking, um, uh, as a French speaking group. But we tried to deal with all the, the questions, but we did, were not able to finish them all because we had some co connection problems. Uh, and very briefly regarding the first uh, question, uh, equal access and par involvement to uh, open government uh, initiatives, the recommendation that could be made would be to really dedicate the time and energy to, uh, to the development and the implementation of uh, communication uh, campaigns and communications which would be relevant, i.e. which would take into account the different uh, publics, the different local context, and which would you use uh, the national languages so as to be able uh, to reach the different stakeholders. And if it is defined and designed at the national level, it should uh, 
uh, use uh, local relays which remain to be identified amongst all the possible uh, actors, be they institutional structures or NGOs or any other uh, actor. So this was the recommendation. And uh, in terms of examples, uh, uh, for a well-thought communication campaign, Madagascar stated that, that uh, the new school day is a privileged moment to reach a large number of stakeholders and using this uh, school timetable and making sure that uh, things are not done during the school holidays. Well, this, these are the kind of things which you need to take into account. And you have to be very cautious about that. We were not able to deal with the new technologies to encourage citizens' mobilization. Sorry, we did not have the time to do that. The link between open government and accountability it was stated that uh, the discussions uh, let us actually well, it, actually the discussions led us to think that if you had to um, take some entry points at the budgetary issues was spontaneously an issue which offers a lot of opportunities or rather they dealt with a lot of uh, accountability issues and was of uh, an immediate interest to people. So it, therefore it was something that was interesting to use to start with, i.e. The, the, the design and the monitoring phase. We have not specifically talked about the management of budgets in a participatory manage, but rather that we talked about the design and the monitoring. And this requires uh, to demystify the budgetary notions with the different stakeholders, particularly those who are really very far from such concepts. And there's an, uh, another example in Madagascar with um, an initiative starting in the schools and uh, going up. And this vision or the, in regarding the articulation between the local levels, uh, the regional and the national levels, we they they talked about the need to develop uh, some mediation or intermediary between the different levels because the elements coming from one level have a certain rational which is the rational for that level and it is not the same you will find at a higher level and this for planning purposes for instance you have to invest resources in uh, the uh, an intermediary between these levels to turn the inputs from one level into something that can be used by the higher level. And the last point concerning the risks and limits for citizen mobilization, we did not have the time to discuss the recommendation, but there is a concern which was mentioned, which is that uh, there are things which exist and which we uh, completely uh, uh, reshuffle when we uh, introduce uh, this notion of and these structures play a role and uh, uh, have a function and you have to analyze what you want to uh, hustle and uh, to, to make sure you will have the same advantages with the new innovations when you want to shake something. And this the shaking, uh, the balance uh, is uh, something that was raised by our colleague from the, the Côte d'Ivoire when he talked about the SNCs because this sometimes uh, uh, turns some processes at the local level into something fragile. And in Madagascar, the how, what is the role of the PTAs and how they were uh, just uh, shaken by the introduction of this participatory government. And if we, we don't know actually if today we have not somehow lost uh, some representativeness in the, the school management committees, compared to the role the Paris Teachers Association used to play, uh, which is somehow modified a little bit by the, by the, the SFC's work. So much so for our group. Thank you.
Thank you, Jonathan. Some fantastic points there. So, you know, there were some really interesting uh, conversations around the tension, I guess, between the different levels from a, a local a local level to a regional level to a national level and the need for mediation. I think that's something that certainly was discussed, uh, you know, in, in part in our group as well. And this question around kind of how do you ensure accountability and, and open government processes in the backdrop of, of resource constraints and because these these processes do take a lot of uh resources a lot of time and then you know the outcome uh, may may not be what everybody uh, is expecting so it's it's a really uh, interesting uh, set of topics to discuss i'm going to move shortly to the uh to the to the, to the final group but before i do i just want to say we'll I'm going to open the floor up after the next uh, set of discussions uh, to anybody else who'd like to make any points or comments or reactions to what's been discussed. So uh, we've got a bit of time uh, after the next uh, after the next presentation just to kind of discuss a little bit further. So if anyone has any ideas or any thoughts, then I will open the floor at that point. Also, if you have any ideas or thoughts you want to put in the chat, feel free to do so. So um, I'd like to finally uh, uh, turn to the, the Spanish speaking group. So uh, Marco Antonio Velez, if you'd like to take the floor, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Good afternoon to all of you. We were in charge of uh, the same activity. We had uh, participants from Guatemala, Mexico, Mexico, and a colleague from Peru. Just like uh, the French team, unfortunately, we were a little behind schedule. We have uh, talked too much on the uh, not too much on the last two topics but the main discussion in the case of latin america focused on the first two issues why well in the latin american case unfortunately we are still having big difficulties in following the main lines of the the first two blocks i.e equality of access in an open government and the use of new technologies maybe in europe you are a little bit more ahead of schedule than we are but in the case of latin america we be also because of the pandemic it has been a big challenge because of the social uh, uh, lockdown in uh, we still have exclusion poverty rural areas that have difficulty of access especially to the internet but still still we have had a number of support uh, and then opinions for example for the equality of access and in an open government there is one recommendation to have public policies and open programs in the different geographical spaces to provide better access conditions in each community to avoid discrimination and exclusion. And we had cases, for example, in Peru, they have the youth program, which besides uh, working on a uh, face-to-face uh, level, they also work on a platform or a virtual mode with a uh, the 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 virtual mode had an easier program but still the program was there and therefore they had greater uh, actions over the months of the pandemic in uh, guatemala they had a similar situation where they have some topics on transparency accountability and in the case of mexico there's also very strong social participation in participation in the kindergartens so that there are visits to make sure that these schools are properly uh, managed uh, in the case of technologies, one of the recommendations was to improve the um, inequality between uh, one place and the other in, the, in terms of connectivity. Not only 
from the state between the state or the public schools and the private school but also within the private schools i gave for example the case of peru where we have some rural areas where some students will live in the heights and uh, they were had the no connectivity whatsoever or it would be difficult for them uh, on the other side of the mountain to get the signal also, we talked about uh, making different activities uh, for using these uh, tools. For example, not everybody knows how to work with the internet connection. So every single activity that we carry out must come with some kind of training on virtual technologies, the use of computers and so on and so forth. And of course, with going back to the face to fill a school to combine both tools that is the virtual tools and the face to face tools we had for example the case that with uh, the virtual education participation group over time on accountability we did not really talk about the issue but i can introduce the peruvian case and i'm sure it is the same as in mexico and guatemala where the technologies, the internet technologies have built a mechanism and they have to become the main tool to assist public policies to control, to audit. But also the institutions themselves must disseminate these data. In the case of Peru, whoever is in charge of disseminating from it does so and they generate more tools to be used in different areas, in different schools and so on. That's what accountability is all about. They have not only to control, but also to publish the data they find out. Now, regarding the risks and limitations, well, in the case of Peru and maybe in all of Latin America, you know that Latin America is a very big region that has a different uh, political context. So maybe you can have transparency in one country and then a weak country comes around or that is not really interested in access to information, accountability or whatever. Or you may have some governmental uh, decisions made that are not necessarily in following suit with what was decided before, where participation may be lowering or even sometimes these prevention or, or audit measures are being seen on a negative cycle. It happens. This is something that's all I can actually say about what we said in our group. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Fantastic. And absolutely, uh, some fantastic points made there around the difficulties uh, in terms of, you know, connections. I think when we were thinking about technology, uh, we were thinking very much about different platforms or things that can help us interact. We weren't thinking necessarily about just basic connectivity being a huge enabler for all of this work. So I think it's a, it's a really, really interesting point. And, and your final question about the, or your final point around the, the political differences within certain regions as well, very, very uh, important to consider. Uh, I think it, it does change the game entirely depending on the, the way that the, the winds are blowing politically in that, in that context. So thank you so much. Um, at this point, I think we've got about five, five or six minutes left um, before the next section. So if, if I'd like to just open the floor, um, if anyone would like to make any further comments or uh, make any points uh, reacting to anything that's been said in the working groups, uh, feel free to raise your hand and, and I will I will call on you. So uh, so the floor is open if you'd like to like to raise your hand. If not, I have some questions prepared uh, for, for, for our, our various uh, speakers. So um, I, I noticed, uh, obviously, there was a, a conversation happening in our group, uh, Oksana, around kind of the, the various different, um, I guess, uh, 
ways of of of, of managing risk uh, and, and how we can kind of I guess deal with some of the issues that we've seen uh, around kind of you know the implementation of open government policies in education. Uh, I just wondered if there was anything more that came through um, through that conversation that you wanted to reflect upon, particularly uh, the question that we were sort of dwelling on around uh, user needs and how we can try and tailor uh, our kind of uh, responses towards the actual kind of um, I guess individuals that we're trying to reach. Uh, did you have anything more you maybe want to say about that? Thanks. I, I guess uh, you're following the remark about the technologies <laughs> issue. Uh, no, this is uh, one of the points that uh, also came in the case study uh, of Ukraine that we were speaking uh, about yesterday and the day before yesterday, that implementing technologies is a very challenging issue because it changes not only um, some small part of uh, department, but it changes the ways of communication and how everyone is engaged and involved, and sometimes even requires a change of thinking. And uh, often we neglect that or uh, underestimate this um, this uh, way of change or this uh, uh, huge uh, undertaking that needs to be done among different stakeholders and especially those who are the owners of the technology, the developers, uh, they find a hard time to put themselves in the shoes of the users. And in the tech world, we have uh, all this user uh, UX uh, design uh, that is often missing, uh, even in the conversation, even superficially in the public sector. But that is really crucial to think of those users that we are designing the technologies for, uh, that it makes the life them easier and not harder even. Uh, because often we have this have gap uh, where technologies first make the life harder because people need to get used to it, get to um get acquainted uh, to understand as uh, Alok from Romania mentioned uh it is really hard especially from those who are from uh lower um who have lower education or uh lower accessibility to uh, computers to even hardware to work with so all this his has to be kept in mind when we think of different risks of engagement, but especially uh, of technologies. Thank you, Oksana. Absolutely. And uh, sorry to put you on the spot in that way. I think it's a, a really important conversation and one that we kind of dwelled on for a while in our conversation. So um, I just wonder if, if Jonathan or Marco have any other um, responses to those to those ideas. So the idea of reaching the right audiences and how to kind of break through. I know there were some comments that you made as part of your um, presentations on, on that. I didn't know if you wanted to maybe elaborate a bit or speak a bit more about those topics, if there was anything that came from your groups on, on the idea of how to reach the right people, or how to engage the right communities. Oui, peut-être euh, sur les aspects technologie. Euh, moi, well, regarding technology, I have two points. On the one hand, you have technologies and new technologies, and there is a lot of technology which is not being used uh, at. Uh, uh, as they should be, such as radio that has been existing for a while. And this is the, the most accessible communication technology in the countries where we, uh, which we have studied or where we take actions. And uh, we, it seems that there is a, still a lot of progress uh, to be made at this level. And the other point is that the use of new technologies is could be useful to produce elements which then should be turned into something more local tech. And if we take the example of uh, the sharing of information regarding uh, uh, schools or resources, that's something very simple. You may have a big technological infrastructure with uh, data and information extracted from uh, the system uh, regarding the sector, but also at the level of the management uh, uh, of uh, public expenditures, uh, just to uh, get to know the budget allocated, the expenses, etc. 
cetera, et cetera. All this is a high technology approach to automate the, the processing of the information, but then the delivery of this information should uh, uh, go back to a very low tech uh, approach uh, using paper, public display, communi verbal communication on radio. So there is a need to maybe um, work at this level when you uh, act at this level when you talk about your technology to use all the technologies to automate the management of uh, 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 information uh, offered by the new technologies and then also the reality adapted to the context when it comes to using uh, all this it allows you to do. Thank you, Jonathan. Absolutely correct. Fantastic points. And I, I really like this idea of, of different uh, communication methods for different audiences and having to use technology in different ways for different to reach different kinds of, of, of people. I think that's a really fascinating concept and one that really came out very strongly, I think, in Madagascar's uh, presentation this morning as well. Fantastic. And um, finally, um, uh, Marco, do you have anything else to add to this conversation before I, I wrap up? Well, yes. I think all public policies need to be designed with education in mind and with different policies regarding that. They need to be accompanied by digital and technological tools. Of course, without excluding the face-to-face -face interaction. So we need to have a mix of both. Virtual participation will never be the same as in-person engagement. So there are several ways of participating and getting engaged in activities. Here in Peru, we have mobile phones as the main technological tool. They are much more present than computers. And through social media, I think, and through Facebook and Twitter in particular, people are more actively engaged. They don't so much access the website for the different institutions. But still, I think we need to make it easier for them to access. The doors need to be open in terms of our institutions. They need to have easy access to us. If we relay information too much between the different sites and pages, people end up losing interest about what we do. And especially in the case of schools, I think students, from their very youth need to get acquainted with those digital tools in order to know how they can better seize them for their work at school and for their work in the future. So they need to get information on what the different ministries are, how to access them, where they are. So they need to have that information as well in order to be able to relay all that into their own academic objectives. That's all. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Marco. Thank you to Jonathan, Marco, and Oksana for your for your comments. And apologies for putting you all on the spot. Um, absolutely fantastic uh, discussion points. So I think that wraps up this session. So I'd like to make some concluding remarks, if I may, um, just uh, on the kind of reflecting on the conversations that have happened today and the various presentations and, and discussion points. Uh, so I'd like to first of all say, obviously, a huge thank you to um, the speakers for their their contributions. I think we've seen a huge variety of examples and discussion points on the topic of citizen involvement in planning. Um, while the solutions, I think, may appear local, uh, the issues that we're all seeing and facing are global. So I think maintaining trust through demonstrable accountability, developing meaningful engagement mechanisms, and maintaining the momentum for programmes developed with the values of open government are actually universal barriers that we all need to overcome in whatever way they manifest um, at a local level. Um, I think the positive story, though, coming from this discussion today has been none of us are alone in our attempts to achieve these goals. I think there is a vibrant and resourceful community of reformers across the world representing many backgrounds, sectors and experiences. And we all share the belief that transparency, accountability and public participation are key considerations for any decision making processes and that engagement and autonomy for communities affected by decisions are absolutely essential for their success. I think we've seen in the college structures, the local consultation structures in Madagascar, the community approach to school management committees in India, and the experiences shared in the interactive working groups, some truly innovative ways to increase participation, local decision making and accountability, while also mitigating against the risks that come with these approaches. 
Um, I'd like to close just by thanking UNESCO International Institute for Educational Planning for the honor of moderating today's session, the speakers once again for their fantastic topics, and the many excellent interventions from attendees and the streaming viewers, and the brilliant translators as well for helping us understand everything that's being discussed. So that's everything from me. Uh, Muriel, back to you. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Sam, for your moderation uh, throughout uh, this day. Very much uh, appreciated for, from all of us. And thanks also for being part uh, in one of the group work session. Uh, thanks for the presenters from the, from the three groups. And I uh, would very much plead the three of them to send us uh, the, the, what came out uh, from your group. And we would be very happy to consolidate this uh, from, the, from the perspective of, uh, of IP. Uh, not trying to repeat all what have been said as part of your group reports, but uh, still trying to maybe draw a number of lessons of what we have been learning throughout uh, those three days uh, from uh, IEP perspective. Um, I think uh, from what we have been hearing uh, during those past uh, three days, it was clear that there is a general context that is creating some kind of a new momentum for the education sector that maybe was not uh, in place before. Um, among all the presentation that we, we have heard, we have heard that uh, in all those countries, well, there are some right to information laws, for instance, that has been legally adopted. Sometimes they has been included as uh, the right to information has been included as part of the constitution uh, of countries. There is an anti-corruption agenda also that is on the table. There is also a data revolution that is underway, even with all the problems that we have heard just before uh, this session on uh, connections and so on. But still, even this event uh, itself, you know, that's a type of event that we no, certainly would not have had uh, in the past with uh, so many ministry representatives throughout the world uh, being uh, connected. Uh, there is also a general commitment that we hear to engage more communities in education to hear more about their needs and this is part of the decentralization agenda that has been on the table for years but that is maybe even more on the agenda uh, today uh, there is also some commitments that has been made by countries through this odp process and there are national ogp commitments that have been made by countries local ogp commitments that have been made and that includes education as one, uh, a number of commitments uh, made uh, by, by countries. And this paves the way for new forms of collaborations within the education sector, as we have heard, uh, with new types of collaboration, for instance, between ministries of education and the general auditor's office, as this is the case uh, in Peru or between the Department of Education of the city of Bogota and the National Public Procurement Agency, as we have heard in the case uh, of Colombia for school meals. So all of this discussion about open government also is paving the way for new forms of collaborations to appear and to, and, and, and to, and to develop. I think one of the things that we have now a bit maybe more clear about what we mean by open government in the education sector, because I'm sure that from the ministry colleagues that uh, participated, the concept itself was quite unclear maybe, uh, when we started all of this discussion. Uh, I think that it is clear now for all of us that the aspect of transparency and open data is very much uh, important, but it has to go hand in hand with forms of citizen engagement, and this doesn't happen only because you have shared information with the public, you need to accompany this process. And then you need to go further than that uh, by including the accountability picture uh, as part of uh, the discussion and la reddition des comptes, or reddition des cuentas, uh, uh, as uh, he said is French or uh, in English. I think we are much clearer about the kind of definition we can provide of open government through the opening up of government data, processes, decisions, and also control mechanisms to uh, citizens' involvement and scrutiny. And we have seen as part uh, of this forum the many different forms that open government can take in the education sector, with example of open policy, as we have heard from the case of Madagascar, of open budgeting, as we have heard from Ukraine or Portugal, open contracting, as we've heard in the case of Colombia, or social auditing and citizen monitoring, as we've heard in the case of India and uh, of Peru. 
as you remember, in the first panel that we had, uh, we discussed about different open government initiatives. And one of the questions that were raised uh, in this session is, what's the right level to discuss open government uh, in the education sector? And the temptation is always to say, well, go local, uh, where citizens are, where communities are. But that's something very difficult to do in the education sector, because that's a sector that is still very much uh, centralized and where all the key decisions, including to involve people uh, as part of this picture, are in fact taken at a central level. And in fact, I think also one of the conclusions we can draw from our discussion is that uh, there is a clear value of the national level uh, in terms of open government initiatives. We've seen that in the example of India, where there were 10 uh, Indian states uh, agency that were uh, uh, involved. In the case of Portugal, where it was the Ministry of Education that was in charge with more than 200 and uh, 200,000 pupils being involved in the process and voting for open uh, budgeting through the initiative that had been taken place. And clearly, there is a value for the national level in terms of the scope of those open government initiatives, in terms of the final financial support that can be provided, in terms also of the expertise that exists uh, from the administration perspective. Also, in terms of the le legitimacy of the whole process that is developed and possibilities also of having some kind of legal recourse at the end of the day as part of this uh, initiative. At the same time, what we've heard is that there is a lot of importance of institutionalizing the process at subnational levels without necessarily national intervention, especially one establishing those platform that dialogues that can be face to face or that can be using ICTs and new technologies. But for those feedback mechanisms, but for the information sharing, clearly this can only take place at decentralized local level or even at a school level. And we have had, again, very beautiful examples uh, like the open school project in Ukraine, where there is an NGO that have helped develop this whole um, open platform regarding budgetary issues at uh, school levels with the possibility with the school actors to provide uh, inputs and, uh, and uh, reaction. And this also, of course, in the education sector needs to take place at the school level with the idea of shared responsibility and ownership from all the stakeholders involved, even though, as we've heard also today, there is still a long way uh, to go. Then, as you will remember, we had some discussion about ensuring equal access and use uh, to uh, those open government initiatives that we have been discussing. Well, the starting point, and this is something we've seen as part of this overall research, is that citizen engagement is still quite low in most countries that the involvement of various categories of stakeholders, of course, differ from one context to another context, according to a number of social cultural uh, uh, factors. In some initiatives like Ukraine, where women were very much involved in other initiatives, uh, like uh, some that were uh, discussed uh, in India, male were more in power uh, as part of the process. But clearly, I think in terms of what came out with these uh, equity questions related to open government initiatives, is that it's very important when putting uh, in place local consultation structures, as this is the case in Madagascar or as part of the school management committees, to pay a lot of attention to le the legitimacy of the representative structures that are put in place. It's very important to use a simplified language and to demystify the bureaucratic language that is used by the uh, education administration to be really in a position to make the link and to bridge uh, with uh, citizens. It's important to use different types of communication strategies in terms of language, resources, but also you remember the beautiful pictures that were shown, for instance, by Kiran about also the use of puppet shows and the local drama and on the street theaters to mobilize people and to mobilize also a variety of institutions, including uh, civil society actors as part of the process. And I think also in this, um, in this panel, there were a very interesting insight about how to involve youth and make better use, uh, better involvement of youth. Uh, Paolo from Portugal reminded us that there were youth parliament in place in Portugal for 25 years. And so 
the fact that now open budgetary is taking place in the whole uh, of Portugal certainly is a direct consequence uh, of this. Now, regarding uh, the other panels we had on how to mobilize uh, ICTs as part of this uh, overall process, well, it was clear from the, the research that face-to-face -face meetings uh, remain the preferred options in many contexts due to low IT literacy, mistrust of technology, problems of internet connections, and so on. But there are other ways uh, to involve citizens, and that's a beautiful example that we've heard from India in terms of creating platform for dialogues between state and citizens, having public hearings, and making sure all time that there is a good accuracy of the information that is provided through uh, these platforms. Still, we've heard also about beautiful and nice examples of use of ICTs as a mean, uh, not as a mean, but as a tool uh, to solve problem. There is this example of uh, Ukraine that was uh, provided to us. And there was also other examples like the one on Colombia uh, with the platform that has been uh, put uh, in place uh, for uh, public procurement and also the example of Peru with this uh, social auditing process involving use where the training and the capacity building of use has been made also using new uh, technologies. Now coming uh, to more that was discussed yesterday and again today about the link on open government and accountability, I think we were we all agreed that answerability is not an end, we have to move towards more enforceability, which means not only the whole process should not lead only for public authorities to share more about their action and report on their action, but really to change uh, practice. Uh, with this whole question about how to close the accountability loop. And here we had beautiful examples of accountability metrics that can be uh, used. And again, you remember the beautiful slide that were showed about the accountability metric that has been put into place as part of the social monitoring uh, exercise that was undertaken in India as a way really to uh, track at uh, school level, at local level, uh, what's going on uh, on the number of key issues that are clearly listed as part uh, of this matrix. As part of this discussion on accountability, well, clearly the role of civil society groups as mediators, as facilitators, provided they are independent from political interference and other local bodies appear as key, and as key also to build trust over time, because clearly one of also of the objective of this whole process is to build better trust uh, among the different stakeholders involved. And I think this is also one of the key conclusions that come out from the various uh, pieces of research that we have had uh, under uh, this research, is that provided the necessary conditions are in place, well, open government can help increase the level of uh, confidence and trust uh, of stakeholders uh, toward the system. Limits and risk, we've discussed this uh, this morning uh, in, uh, in the first panel session. Tensions and frustrations, new forms of clientelism, mistrust about what those local uh, consultation uh, structures can develop, and altogether the conflict of legitimacy uh, that appears between, on the one hand, the educational administration and the professional legi legitimacy that they have from the more democratic legitimacy of citizens or people represented through uh, local um, consultation uh, structures. Uh, but there were also a number of uh, suggestions and recommendations that were made in terms of capacity buildings, in terms of building new ways uh, to make those people at the local level exchange among themselves with, for instance, uh, training and peer training across federation of school management committees and the others uh, were mentioned. And as a conclusion to all of these and all of these discussion coming out from these uh, five panel sessions, I would like to end up with two things. First, it was uh, the slide that was shown to us uh, during this uh, today panel from Sunita, talking about the emerging open government model uh, in India. And uh, I think that the word uh, emerging is important, uh, meaning that we need to see 
all of this uh, as part of a, an ongoing evolution of local democracy. And, and another thing, a second thing that I would like uh, to keep also at the end of those three days is a, and another sentence from an other Indian colleague uh, that was mentioned yesterday, Kiran, mentioning the importance of adapt, adopting a collaborative rather than a confrontationalist stance in all of those processes that at the end of the day all have to do with the promotion and the development of uh, local uh, democracy. And I think it's only by practice that you convince people. You don't uh, convince people uh, just by, uh, uh, you know, having big words and by putting big principles on the table. You convince people by practice, by piloting, by experiencing, and also in context, obviously, where you have some kind of political will to have things to move on. But in fact, this is really one of the things that we have tried to do as part of this uh, overall research to show all of these initiatives, you know, that are developing throughout the planet at local level, at school level, at national level. They are not fully satisfactory. There is still a long way to go. There are a lot of challenges, risks and constraints. But at the same time, I think they are showing the way. They are paving the way for other similar initiatives to develop in the same country, in the same context, or even cross borders. And that was also the objective of this forum during those, four, uh, during those three days, is to provide insight on what's happening, what other countries are doing to engage youth, for instance, uh, but also to involve citizens in uh, social monitoring and all the examples that have been uh, provided all together. So I hope that uh, those three days uh, will have given you food for thought. And I hope also that it will encourage you to go to our website uh, to download the different case studies that have been prepared as part of this research. Most of them are already available online and uh, two more will be uh, made available online uh, before uh, the end of the year. And also in 2022, we will have a synthesis report and we will keep your email address and we'll be happy to share the information with you about this re synthesis report with all of these initiatives and comparative results that we will be happy to, to share with you. And we will also in 2022 uh, develop and design some practical guidelines lines uh, to guide especially decision makers and educational planners and managers on how to design and to implement open government uh, initiatives. And so all of your feedback and all we've heard also as part of your group report is something that we are going to integrate as part of those uh, two uh, pieces. So that's what I wanted to tell you after those uh, three days. Uh, I wanted also to tell you that uh, as for all of these events, uh, we would like you to provide some uh, evaluation of those three days. And I'm sure my colleagues are going now to share with you the links uh, toward the evaluation form uh, for the forum. And so please do take the time uh, to fill in uh, those, uh, this form. That's important for us because now, you know, we are moving more and more as all uh, institutions on an online mode. And so we are also ourselves uh, learning by doing. And so all the kinds of uh, inputs uh, that you can provide um, uh, about, well, your general perception of this event, please do not hesitate to share it as part of this uh, evaluation questionnaire and also to provide whatever suggestions or recommendations to improve uh, as possible. Uh, I wanted also to let you know that uh, maybe uh, beyond uh, the, uh, what we have been discussing uh, during those uh, three days, if you want to learn more about the work that is undertaken by our institution on issues related to transparency, accountability, anti-corruption in the education field, open school data, open government, and so on, please do not hesitate uh, to go to our website that you have here. And so the address of this website is http uh, double dot slash slash etico, that's the name etico.aip.unesco.org. And I'm sure my colleagues will uh, put uh, this uh, website into the chat. 
so that uh, you can learn a little bit more about what we are doing uh, as part of this overall capacity building program that we have at IP on transparency, accountability and anti-corruption issues. And if you are interested to follow us, we have also a newsletter, the Ethico Baltin. Uh, so please feel free to subscribe on this Baltin from the Ethico website. And that would be a way for you to be kept informed about what we are doing in this uh, area. Finally, as you know, we are part of a more global uh, institution, which is uh, IEP. And uh, we have all of your email address, all of the people that subscribe to this forum and that follow us either on Zoom or uh, the colleagues also on, uh, on YouTube through streaming. And so we would be happy to send you uh, our also regular newsletter from IP so that you can be kept informed about all what we do research work as we have what we have been sharing with you over those three days but also training capacity building and many other types of activities so with this i would like uh, to thank you all for your attention for those uh, three days it was very much a pleasure to be uh, with all of you to have the opportunity to exchange with all of you I would like also uh, to thank our interpreters, uh, the three teams, beautiful teams of interpreters that was with us uh, throughout this forum, and maybe to have a round of applause for them, because interpretation is always um, a difficult job, but especially when you are doing it uh, online with all issues related to connections, bad sound and so on, that's maybe even more tricky. And so we are extremely grateful uh, to them to, to make this possible, to have all of those communities speaking in French, English and Spanish live and, um, and in a very beautiful way. So thanks a lot to all of you. It was really a pleasure. And I would like also, of course, uh, to thank all the organization team for this event. There were many people, as you uh, will imagine, behind uh, this uh, three-day forum that have been uh, working hard and late. Um, and um, forgive me if I uh, forget anyone, but really I would like to thank uh, Eva that have, uh, has been really following uh, all of this um, and all of the subscription of all of you uh, throughout the time. Camilla that has been here also all the time, very precious uh, help. Uh, Andrea also, lots of thanks to Andrea, to Feng Shu, to Alexandra to all the colleagues from the IT unit and especially Amaranta for all her help. Romain that has been joining uh, IP to help us with all of this live streaming and your help and support has been extremely helpful. Philippe always all, all, all of help for all kinds of things. And also the three interns that have been following, especially on the chats of the live stream and the YouTube, Marvin, Chantal, Viola, uh, thanks really to all of you uh, for your help and support and it was a pleasure uh, to be able to work again as a team because you know with uh, this pandemic working as a team has become more and more difficult we all tend to go individual that was also a beautiful opportunity i think for us uh, to work as a team and to finish i would like to ask all of you that are still uh, online and connected to open your camera because our colleagues from the communication unit would like to take beautiful photos of all those that are still on their screen. So please, uh, colleagues, do open all your, uh, your camera. And we will take the final photo of this event. So the communication colleagues uh, should tell us when, when they're ready for that. Are you ready, Feng Shu, to post all the... Thank you, colleagues. Yeah. Um, I am about to camera. take this screenshot. Please smile to the camera. Three, two, one. And another one. Three, two, one. Again. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, colleagues. See you next time.
la prochaine. Merci beaucoup, au revoir. Ok, thank you. Bye from Ghana. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. Au revoir.